afternoon, everybody. Um, we're all probably familiar with the, the program, The Weakest Link, um, and um, she points at whoever it is who's lost that round and says, you are the weakest link, goodbye. Um, probably all too familiar as well with the fact that often in security, it's individual humans who also prove to be the weakest link um, from the point of view of computer security. So I just want to focus on that because actually sometimes um, it gets overlooked in businesses, organizations of all kind. Sometimes if it isn't overlooked, it's not necessarily treated in an appropriate way. And yet it is, as I will argue, a critical area within computer security. Um, first of all, though, to talk about the, the threat generally in terms of the numbers that we're seeing anyway, um, we've got about 9 million signatures in our <coughs> database currently. So quite big numbers. But actually, if you look at the number of unique samples overall, we see about 200,000 each and every day. So that's about 100 million totally in the database. And there's obviously a, obviously a differential between the signatures and the total count of malware. And the reason for that is twofold. First, and probably the least important of those reasons, is the fact that often one signature is sufficient to detect many, many variants of the same family. More importantly, increasingly, proactive technologies get used in order to detect malware. And that's really been the case for the last five or so years. Signatures are a diminishing area within what is traditionally called antivirus, but actually what is a, covers a whole lot more areas, really. Um, if we can look at the, 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 the structure of these things, on, on the right-hand side of this classification, you know, you've got the, uh, the identifier of what variant it is. Um, and that picks up a point I mentioned uh, a minute ago about variants. Actually, that huge increase in volume that we've seen, actually not just over the last five years, but over the last 25 years, um, increasingly, often it is variants of the same malware family. And they literally get churned out like a factory process. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, one of the reasons for that is if we were to patch over the top of that a line showing the persistence of one threat, one variant of one family, it would go the other way. In other words, back in the 90s, threats like Cascade or Form or Natas might last years, year upon year upon year. That's rare now. So you might see the Zeus botnet or the Zeus banking trojan, uh, and it might stay around for a while, but actually each individual variant of Zeus maybe will only last one week or two weeks at best. So in order to get uh, persistence, in order to get uh, shelf life, if you like, out of any given thread, these guys incorporate a download element, which downloads the next version, and the next, and the next, and the next. Mobile threats are growing too. Um, not quite at the same rate, but fast. Uh, and to put it in perspective, in 2011, we saw the same volume of threats that we'd seen in the previous six years. In 2012, we saw a six-fold increase again. So they are ramping up, but compared to that flood, that 200,000 a day samples we get, it's still only a trickle, but it is growing. And actually, at least as important in terms of mobile devices is the data stored on them and the danger of those devices falling into the wrong hands because people lose them or they get stolen. So if we look at the, the threats, that's the numbers, but what about the nature of the threats? And there's no question actually that they are very, very sophisticated. So typically a, a threat, let's say a drive-by download, an infection you get because you happen to visit a web page. Quite often obfuscation is used to try to make our lives more difficult, make it harder to analyze what's there and therefore provide protection for it. Um, and you have to go through several layers in order to get to the bottom part, which is an iframe, a redirect from one place to pull in content from somewhere else which actually installs malware on your system. So code obfuscation, what used to be called when it was standalone programs, polymorphism, variable encryption of code. That's very common. 
we see concealment, what in the old days used to be called stealth. The use of technologies like root kits and boot kits in order to act as a malware invisibility cloak, to hide files installed on the disk, to hide activity, to hide processes belonging to a particular program. And, and just to clarify what a boot kit is, it's something basically which is inserted at the first point on the physical disk. So the BIOS loads up, passes control blindly to the first sector on the disk, and loads the code that's on there. If that is not the master boot record or MBR, but is actually a, a root kit, then it gets to load first. And the earlier it loads, the easier it is to exercise control from the point of view of the cyber criminal. And boot kits now are, are have become, anyway, a lot more common. Root kits are fairly standard. Um, they operate at various levels, user level or kernel mode level, but the purpose of them really is to hide code. So you don't see the back door, let's say, which is doing the real job that the malware writer wants it to do, which is to gather data, let's say. Um, digital certificates are being used. And sometimes they're fake digital certificates. Sometimes they're stolen legitimate certificates. No surprise, if you look over the last two years, among the different organizations that have been breached, we see a fair share of certificate authorities. Because if you can rubber stamp your malware with a legitimate digital certificate, then you fly under the radar in a lot of cases. If you take a sort of plain vanilla whitelisting approach, and everything from vendor X gets authorized within the system, then anything digitally stamped by vendor X or certificate authority X is also going to be missed. If we look overall at the types of attack we're seeing, although the, the stuff up here, the targeted attacks, receives a lot of attention and has done really for the, for the last year increasingly, most threats continue to be that sort of mass of random speculative attacks, not aimed at you or me specifically, but just aimed at anybody who happens to be unlucky enough to fall into the trap. It's only really the top 10% which form the very highly targeted, highly focused malware. And the orange part there um, will be the stuff really targeted at businesses of any kind. Um, and the aim really is to, to gather information. The aim is maybe to damage reputation. Uh, the aim may be to um, gain a competitive advantage. There's all kinds of reasons why maybe somebody would want to breach a system. But there are organizations of all kinds that fall into that category. Um, and it includes what gets termed, I, I hate the word, but hacktivism. In other words, the internet used to protest or used to cause embarrassment or make a point in some way. At the very tip of that pyramid, we've got the, the very focused attacks where um, you're really talking about resources above and beyond a cyber criminal gang and what they would be looking at. So these would be the sorts of things that where we would, on our uh, reports or blogs, would say, you know, we suspect there may be nation state involvement here. Uh, you know, the names Stuxnet, Dooku, that, that kind of thing. Um, and they're geared towards either wiping data, or they're geared towards stealing information, or they're geared towards actually causing damage to a system, sabotaging, undermining a system in some practical way. So we've got huge volume, we've got very sophisticated attacks, but actually hacking the human as a resource within any organization quite often remains the first port of call. So yeah, there may be a boot kit, uh, there may be some sophisticated surveillance going on, there may be some very sophisticated techniques used to escalate privilege, privileges within the organization or to um, you know, communicate between the compromised endpoint and the control and command server and under the, uh, the control of the cyber criminals. But actually the first point is often the individual. And it may be that people respond to messages. It may be that people respond to stuff in social networks. 
But they're doing it for different reasons. I mean, on the one hand, it can be because they're not aware of what the potential consequences of their action could be. It could be that they're cutting corners, they're short on time. It could be that they, there's the lure of something for nothing. Um, you know, who doesn't like something for nothing? But if you don't realize the consequences, then maybe clicking on that you know, doesn't seem such a bad idea, even if you get nothing out of it at the end, because you don't realize what the bad thing uh, is going to happen to you. And as I say, it could be you know, the lure of pornographic content. It could be pirated content. You'd seldom individuals make the same mistake again and again and again. We see the same mistakes again and again and again, but individuals don't necessarily. But this stuff is based on manipulation of human psychology. There's always a new mistake to be made because there's always some new topic. It could be the Olympics, it could be celebrity gossip, it could be porn, it could be a natural disaster, it could be a charitable giving, it could be somebody pretending to be from Microsoft urging you to click on a link and get a patch to the system. It could be just plain sneaky, people masquerading as a legitimate resource, in this case Twitter. It could be that somebody is cashing in on somebody's fear. They've heard about cybercrime um, and they're thinking, oh, you know, they get a pop-up which tells them that they need to protect their system or worse still, that something bad has happened on their system and they better click on the link and install some protection. And maybe they haven't got anything. Maybe they have, but they think it wasn't good enough and something slipped through the net. So they click on the link. It's still kind of something for nothing until it tells you there's something bad and tells you it wants money in order to clean up whatever it's found. It could be that they cash in on people's worries in the financial area. So I don't know whether you remember a couple of years ago well publicized that there had been some mistakes made in the inland revenue, as it used to be called, and some people's tax had been miscalculated. So emails like this so it was sent out to people, urging people to click on a link to check whether they were in the list of people who could get money back. It's a good reason to click on something. It's not a good idea, but you can see why it's a good reason. Even in the mobile space, we're starting to see this kind of technique be used. I mean, for one thing, most mobile malware is looking to get access to the core system, and the obvious way to do it is to actually get my rights to the system, and therefore it needs the same privileges I have for accessing contents, accessing contacts, accessing the messaging system, and so they will use whatever technique they can. I mean, this one actually is from um, a man in the mobile attack, which is designed to get mobile transaction um, authentication numbers for a, a banking, an online banking transaction. BlackBerry uh, targeted by this, also Android. Um, and see, it's masquerading as a legitimate security company, again, cashing in on people's fears. And again, battery life evaluation. Everybody looks at the battery and how it goes down on their mobile device. What better than an app that can you know, help you to evaluate if everything's okay and maybe optimize things so your battery doesn't run down as much. But these are just a flavor of the things which you know, people um, get, get lured in to. Now, most of what I've shown so far has been the sort of individual speculative attacks on people. Maybe they come as, as some general spam. But it's not all like that. Sometimes they are focused on an individual. So-called spear phishing attacks. It's not difficult to work out that Kaspersky.com is, is our uh, domain structure. It's not difficult, really, to find out who our sales and marketing managers are. It probably isn't that difficult to find out who works in our IT department. It's not difficult necessarily to find out who works in tech support if you do a little bit of background checking and some phone calls. And putting all of that together, it would then be easy to pitch an email at me looking like it's come from somebody in the 
IT department or tech support. I don't mean looks like in just in the sense of spoofing the from address, but actually has some background information that puts me off guard. It says, hey David, it's John in IT. Um, hope the trip to Istanbul went well and was productive. Hope you've recovered. We're doing an audit. Need you to click on this. I'm busy, I'm tired, whatever it is. Click on the link and off you go. So we're seeing all kinds of, of attacks like that being French. So these targeted attacks, which otherwise are very, very sophisticated in some cases, are starting by hacking the human. And they go on and on. And this one, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Syrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Sophisticated attack, basic starting point. Get somebody to do something. Even, in some cases, go into the junk mail folder, pull something out, and click on the attachment. It sounds like it couldn't happen, and, and we all chuckle about it, but day in, day out, it does happen. Now, my main point about this, um, before I get to the what is to be done, is that if we as humans, and the people we work with, are part of the problem, we have to be part of the solution. And as organizations, we need to find creative ways to patch humans just as we seek to patch our digital resources, so to speak, or our physical ones, you know, with bad gentry and, and the rest of it. <coughs> and yet, too often we don't. So it's a human problem is the first thing to recognize. Maybe it needs an HR solution, because they're the human experts. But actually, you find in lots and lots of organizations, the people who get the job of communicating with individuals, with staff members, are techies. And that's, it's obvious to see why, because the techies know the technology, the techies understand the stuff I've been talking about. But actually, with, with some exceptions, often notable exceptions, techies aren't the people who are professional communicators. Sometimes they're good at it, sometimes they're not. But actually, if, if, I, if my company wants to communicate with the outside world, they don't come and ask me, they don't go to... Um, you know, Marta, they don't go to our tech support guys, they go to our sales and marketing teams and they put a campaign together or they use an outside agency for this or that campaign. Why not internally? They're expert communicators. We overlook a resource there. Um, so obviously IT has to be involved. I'm not saying it doesn't, but we need to be a bit more creative. One of the things when you, you, you pitch anything at anybody is you need to tick various boxes depending on what people's psychological makeup is. Some people like lists, some people like pictures, some people like a mixture of the two, some people like audible signals, they focus on what's said to them. But too often we sit people in front of us to talk to them and that's pretty much it. Often we talk about training and we gear our awareness around the same sort of coat hangers, we hang, hang our communication off the same sort of hangers, as if it was Microsoft Office or Salesforce or something else that we're trying to get across. And actually, you, you, know, you can't train somebody to be security minded. Now it's true, when children are small, we take them up to the edge of the road and we, you know, we give them various mantras for being safe. Look right, look left, look, look left again, well, whatever it is. The point is, I, I feel safe on the road. I don't remember the mantra. And that's what I want for my children. I don't want them to kind of have a, a rote learn approach to this or that road. I want them to realize that roads are dangerous for X, Y, and Z reasons. And actually, with a variety of strategies, including pelican crossing, zebras, looking to make sure nothing's there, they stay safe on the road. And that's really what we want from our staff as well. So security is a mindset. And actually, on the same subject, I uh, could be jumping the gun here, security is like housework, and it's not just how you treat the humans, but security is like housework anyway. I do it this week, and the house is spotless, but I know I'm going to have to do it next week and the week after. But I don't give up the ghost and say, well, you know what, it's too big a job. I keep the place tidy because I redo it. Psychology is a is important. I, I mean, one of the things I, I did a while back was drop this word user, because I honestly can't think of any other area, bar one, where the word user gets used. And that's to do with drug taking. And if we come at our colleagues as users, think about it. I mean, we're already setting up a, a relationship there 
we talk about dumb users. Now, you know, I've got various colleagues who focus on different kinds of stuff, but one of them, David Jacoby, his whole background is about vulnerabilities, exploits, and, and stuff. And he makes the point very clearly, it's not just users that do dumb things that don't change, you know, what about changing the default password on a web server? That's not down to dumb users, that's down to dumb administrators. The, the fact is that we're all humans, so I, I actually would suggest changing that. There's always an alternative word. It could be staff member, it could be employee, it could be consumer, it could be customer, actually. Individual, people, there's, all, there's always a, a different word. But actually, if you realize that they're people and that they're, they've got different trigger mechanisms, different <coughs> things which will motivate them, then it's really important. And among those sort of imaginative ways in which we can try and patch individuals, um, we need to kind of just sometimes step outside the box. Maybe use soap opera. People love soap operas. You, you know, if you look at EastEnders, it's gone from once a week to twice a week. There's an omnibus, and the same people watch the omnibus sometimes that watch the one during the week. The same for Coronation Street. People love soap operas. Create a soap opera. Maybe a cartoon strip or something else. Or, or literally an audio bite. A very short podcast. Do, do something which kind of makes people, uh, gets them engaged and makes them think. Keep the message really simple, but actually if they're looking for the next installment of the soap opera, they're getting drip-fed security while they're having fun. Maybe posters. Maybe set up a table with some sort of corporate security gotchas. You know, with the post-it note with the password on the monitor. And a, a computer which didn't get locked. Control alt delete when you leave the computer. So, and, and actually maybe have a prize. Encourage staff to look at the gotchas and count them up. And give a prize for the people who get the best ones. It could include non-computer security, like leaving pages and pages of stuff there for anybody to read. It could include, you know, maybe health hazards as well. Social engineering works. I mean, we know that, and you look at some of those things that people get lured in by, we know social engineering works. We can use that to our benefit. So, is it a quick fix? No, it isn't. But then, actually, few things that affect humans are. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when you could get into a car and drive it without putting a seatbelt on. Now, nearly everybody, nearly all of the time, puts a seatbelt on. But we didn't get to that <coughs> overnight, and we didn't get to that by passing legislation. We got to it through public information films, a series of them. Same with drink driving. Have a drink, have a drive, go out and see what you can find. There's a lyric to a song, circa 1969. I'm not sure you'd get away with having a song like that now. It would be considered socially unacceptable. So you get from point A to B, sometimes it takes a long time. But actually, you've got to, you've got to start somewhere. And I think it's important. Self-interest, finally, is always a good one. Because if you pique people's interest and you make it very real for them, they suddenly get it, and people are much more switched on, all of us are, if we get something and we understand why. So if you run maybe a short session on securing a wireless router, and why that can secure people at home and their children, then maybe it's like, oh, okay, I kind of see why maybe some of this security stuff's there. Or the password thing, tapping into what, what Steve said. Um, you know, if, if people realize why it's so important, then maybe going through the extra few steps is worth the effort. Because if they know nothing about the potential consequences, it's not going to be worth the effort of doing it. So among all of the, the stuff on here and the, the various different types of technology, and the stuff on the right, the strategy and risk assessment side, I've highlighted staff education because too often you see a policy document which people have to sign when they start at an organization, and that's it. And sure, the content might be great about what they should and shouldn't do, or must or must not do, but actually start it, starting at day one is not the best time to, to get people, and using just a, a signed off policy document is not the best, best way to get them on board. <coughs> 